Okay, I can see everyone's coming in now as we get settled. Perfect. So welcome everyone to our first fireside chat for 2024. Um, this is our first health professional chat and we do a monthly um, chat just for the general public as well. So it's great to have you all here joining us this afternoon. Um, we'll give it a, just a couple of minutes just to let everyone get settled. But as we do that, it would be great to um, get to know where you are from and what your profession is. So in the chat function in Zoom, if you want to pop in um, where you're joining us from and what you do, that would be fantastic. And firstly, what I'd like to do is um, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of on the land in which we meet today. I'm presenting from Cumberwell country and I acknowledge the many various lands on which you will work and join us from today. I'd also like to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today and I pay my respects to elders past and present. We'll just start with some general housekeeping. So this session will be recorded. So anyone that can't make it will have access to this afterwards. Um, for the duration of the session, I'll just get you to pop yourself on mute um, just so it doesn't jump around. Um, but at the end of the session, we'll be opening it up for a Q&A. So if any questions come up during our session, please feel free to pop them up as they come up in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll get to them at the end if it's not covered already. Um, if you want to put your uh, videos on as well, it's really nice to be able to put faces to names as well. So feel free to do that also. So I will get started by introducing Dr. Michelle Woolhouse. So Michelle is one of Australia's leading integrative GPs with over 20 years experience in lifestyle medicine. She's Vively's medical director and has played an integral role in the development of the Vively program and all of its offerings. She's written a wonderful book, The Wonder Within, and is also host of the FX Medicine podcast. Thanks so much for being here today, Michelle. Hey, everyone. Lovely to be here. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name's Charlotte Battle. I am an accredited practicing dietitian and personal trainer with 10 years experience in the health industry. I provide Vively's in-app dietitian services as well as consulting on the Vively platform and programs. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to share some of um, the insights about how Vively can really revolutionize your practice as well as exploring and deep diving into metabolic health. So Michelle, I'm going to pass over to you. Um, just to give us a rundown of what we'll be going through today. Sure. Well, Charlotte and I, when we were talking about this session, just wanted to make sure that we were going through quite a lot of the basics. You know, sometimes the basics get mixed, missed, um, you know, in the context of all these new sort of up and coming research. So we're going to go through what metabolic health is. Um, over the last decade or so, there's just been some really fantastic, I guess, new ways of looking at the interconnection of what metabolic health is. So we're going to go through that. And we're also then going to really have a look at how we assess metabolic health. So just beyond the kind of um, fasting or random blood glucose or even the hemoglobin A1C and really have a look at how we can properly assess metabolic health in um, our clients and patients. And then we're going to have a look at optimizing and personalizing metabolic health. So some of the tricks and tips um, and how the intersecting players all play a role in making sure that we're getting the best out of our patients. And then, of course, as Charlotte mentioned, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of it. So there'll be time for questions and discussions. So this is called a fireside chat. So Charlotte and I will just chat together in terms of our clinical skills and stuff. So um, if we talk over each other, that's kind of part of the fireside fireside chat. Um, so take it away. Take it away, Charlotte. Fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. So if you want to get started, let's dive into what actually is metabolic health. So what is the sure. definition? So I guess, you know, metabolic health has kind of been bandied around for a long time. And we kind of, most people sort of think about metabolism, either, either having a fast metabolism where you use up energy really quickly. And they're the people that tend to need to eat all the time, five or six times a day and, and tend to kind of almost run on empty. Um, and versus a slow metabolism where people would actually feel that they don't have to eat very little to um, to get their energy requirements or they tend to put on weight quickly. But it's a much more intricate system than just having a fast or slow metabolism. 
And it includes various factors about how we optimize our energy usage throughout the body. And it's related to the, um, the blood glucose levels. So whether they're high, whether they're low, whether they're stable, whether they're variable, whether the cells are actually getting the right messages um, from blood glucose. Glucose also impacts um, muscle health and the liver health. Um, and so there's, there's a few uh, associated organs that play a role in how blood glucose works too. Metabolism is represented by blood pressure. So blood pressure is a mechanism that comes from the cardiovascular system, but it's also how tense the cardiovascular system is. So blood pressure is a critical factor in terms of metabolic health. Cholesterol levels. So cholesterol is a key um, lipid within the body, which we make most of our cholesterol in our liver. And it's a vital chemical messenger for um, vitamin D, uh, production for sex steroid ho hormones um, and of course liver health and cell membrane health as well. Fat storage plays a major role in metabolism so how we store fat if we can access that stored fat and there's a couple of complementary hormones that we probably won't get into today but there's more and more hormones being discovered about how we actually manage our metabolic health things that you might have heard of is leptin and ghrelin. Um, so in addition to, to insulin, which you probably have heard of. Energy production is a key feature of metabolic health, so how well we use our energy. Um, metabolic health is also about growth. It's about having reserves of energy there for when we need it, if we're under attack or need to protect ourselves from a saber-toothed tiger. We don't tend to need to do that, but some people across the planet do still. Um, so energy production is a key feature of metabolic health and how quickly we can switch energy requirements. And the latest really in metabolic health is, is also understanding its role in inflammation. So inflammation can be both positive and negative. We can have too much inflammation or not, not enough inflammation. And inflammation at a subacute level can actually be an underlying factor for most of the chronic diseases that we see in epidemic proportions today. Detoxification is another key feature. Um, we require quite a lot of energy to detoxify. Um, we think about the gut and the liver being key detoxification organs, but of course it, it does also involve the lung, uh, the skin and the kidney uh, as well. Mitochondrial health, there's been a lot of research in terms of the role of metabolic health in the mitochondria. So for those that um, are not traditionally trained in the, in the Western sciences, mitochondria are the energy producing elements inside the cell. Uh, and they are vital for producing the key energy components called ATP. And so when we've got sluggish metabolic, mitochondrial health, we tend to have poor energy um, production and tend to feel worse after exercise, which should essentially make us feel better. And all of that combines to also relate to our immunity. So immunity is required, um, you know, all the time for, to protect us from the outside environment and internal environment. It also plays a very important role in inflammation, but it's a very important component of metabolic health as well. So optimally functioning of these systems without medication is to be considered metabolically healthy. So you can see the vast um, array of symptomatology that could come from a sluggish or suboptimal metabolic system. So the impacts of poor metabolic health is wide, it's varied, it's personalized, and it has major implications on long-term health. So it's not just about type two diabetes. So if we have next slide. So these are the diseases and symptoms arising from poor metabolic health. And these are just a few. So type 2 diabetes, most of us, you know, are well aware of the impact of type 2 diabetes. It's at epidemic proportions across the globe. It's rising at quite astronomical rates, particularly in the third world. Uh, it's often due to things like sedentary lifestyle and um, the impacts of ultra processed foods, uh, along with toxins, stress, poor sleep, and a whole raft of different things as well. Type 2 diabetes is often linked to cardiovascular disease and stroke. So we know that those people that have type 2 diabetes are much more likely to go on and have cardiovascular disease and stroke. 
Um, and also dementia is strongly associated with metabolic dysfunction as well. So much so that they're actually terming some forms of dementia as type three diabetes. So we know that high insulin levels actually precede poor glucose metabolism and that that can uh, impact cognition and focus and even learning and memory. And there's a lot of research going into the rises of dementia alongside the rises of these metabolic issues that we're seeing. Premature aging is another one. Um, so from premature aging of the skin, but also to cellular aging as well, which we can't see quite so clearly, but biological age um, uh, is, is different to chronological age. So you could be, say, 54 years of age, and that's your chronological age, but you might have a biological age of, say, 60 or 65. And so we know that sluggish metabolisms or impaired aspects of the metabolism is associated with premature aging. And obviously we don't want that. Um, osteoarthritis is another one, which is sort of seen to be kind of on its own and thought to be due to um, obviously obesity and poor joint mobility and sedentary behavior. But we do know that the chronic low grade inflammation associated with metabolic dysfunction is actually part and parcel of the pathogenesis of osteoarthritis. So fatty liver is another um, symptomatology. In some statistics, particularly on the World Data site, they believe that about 50% of the world's population now have fatty liver, um, so much so that its name has been changed to NAFLD, which stood for non-alcohol-related fatty liver disease, to metabolically associated fatty liver disease. So MAFLD is the new term for that. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is on the rise. Um, back in my day, medical school was probably in the single digit percentages. Uh, in parts of America, it's up to 20% of the population now have polycystic ovarian syndrome. In Australia, it's roughly about 11 to 13% um, of the population, which is, which is growing fast. And we often diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome as early as late teenagers to early 20s. So that is showing a metabolic dysfunction quite early in a person's age. Um, obesity, particularly central obesity and um, visceral fat, so laying down of the fat that surrounds the viscera um, is definitely a um, uh, symptom of poor metabolic health. Um, insulin resistance, which we've got another slide on that, so I won't spend too much time, but insulin resistance, the way that um, the insulin signaling or messaging um, systems of the body are impaired due to poor metabolic health and that leads to a whole raft of different issues. Cataracts, which is a classic one, which commonly, you know, it's almost a pathognomonic aspect of aging. People have normalized cataracts as a part of the aging process and it doesn't necessarily have to be so. But we know that cataracts are due to glycation of the lens. And so that is due to high levels of glucose within the blood and represents a metabolic dysfunction as well. Um, poor skin healing uh, is another as I mentioned, brain fog and cognitive decline um, and uh, microvascular diseases such as kidney disease, sarcopenia, which is a disease of um, poor muscles, um, often associated with aging, but there's a decline in muscle health. And as I mentioned before, muscles are seriously important um, powerhouses of metabolic health and have huge amounts of active um, uh, what they call myokines, so they're inflammatory, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory chemicals inside the muscles, and depression. So depression is also now considered quite significantly a metabolic health issue. I mean, obviously, there's personal factors and social factors and relationship factors as well associated with um, a mood disorder such as depression, but depression is definitely being put into the realm of poor metabolic health. So it's quite a lot. Yeah, <laughs> to to deal with. So this is a big problem that um, Fiverly is is trying to tackle, and we feel like um, picking up these signs early, where the disease process is um, at the beginning, or you know, really, really in the realm of reversibility. Um, it's kind of exciting times for um, intervention for lifestyle factors. 
and they're so interconnected as well. So many of these things, when you see your patients, it's like they might be ticking so many of these boxes. So it's trying to find out where do we start. Um, That's with right. As well. And it's also the education that, you know, we're starting with, with these interconnecting factors, which actually makes it a whole lot easier in some ways, rather than thinking I'm dealing with five different diseases, bringing it back to um, uh, to having a look and making sure that you're maximising and optimising the metabolic system, you'll actually see positive benefits in a whole raft of different issues throughout the body. Um, so glucose metabolism, it's... Um, it's a very, you know, both simple, simple and complex, um, you know, very important part of our day-to-day uh, -day existence. So glucose metabolism starts with the consumptions of carbohydrates in, um, in meals. That influences the blood glucose response. The impact is dependent upon the type of carbohydrate that is eaten, the glycemic index of the foods, and other foods consumed as well as the insulin sensitivity. So it's what the internal environment will do, what foods that you're eating, the timing of the foods that are eating um, as well. So and the level of musculature and how healthy your liver is all impact glucose metabolism. So the ways to measure it traditionally have just been um, measuring fasting glucose. And the thoughts behind that was really it was that was at the time where we only really had blood tests. And then about, mm, gosh, it was probably 20, 25 years ago, in came this um, test called hemoglobin A1C. And that was actually a marker of glucose metabolism over a three-month period. And hemoglobin A1C is a representation of the glycation of hemoglobin. And uh, so it's, that was a really profound change in just having a look at things like fasting glucose. Fast forward to today. So over the last mm, five or so years, we've got this new technology, which is called continuous glucose monitors, and it's become more widely available. So continuous glucose monitors actually allow a filament to sit inside the skin, which lasts for about two weeks and they measure the interstitial uh, fluid, the glucose in the interstitial fluid, and there's an algorithm that helps to match it towards the blood glucose levels. And so you get a very dynamic, um, very moving picture of what the glucose um, levels are doing over a day by day, week by week, um, fortnightly by fortnightly picture. So it gives a lot more detail as to its relationship to various lifestyle factors. And so it's been a truly a very, very um, new dynamic change in the space of um, looking at glucose metabolism. Obviously, there's still finger prick tests, which are um, very accurate um, point in time, but often painful. Um, and people doing it all the time will build up calluses on their fingers. And um, so it's a less pleasant um, test. And there's the oral glucose tolerance test, which is an excellent test still, but it takes about three hours and you have to drink a ghastly, sweet, sickly glucose drink, <laughs> which is huge, 75 grams, and you test the glucose response over a couple of hours. So glucose metabolism, you know, is seen in a simple way. Is, is it too high or is it too low or is it? Is it just about right? And there is much more to it than that. And so what the research has been telling us over the last couple of years is that glucose spikes and dysregulation of glucose, so lots of highs and lots of lows, are actually impacting the cells more than we previously thought. And one of the reasons that was picked up on that is they were looking at regulating blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetes and they were finding that that was helping with things like nephropathy, which is kidney problems, neuropathy, which is nerve problems, and retinopathy, which is in the back of the eyes. But they weren't making a huge amount of inloads into cardiovascular risk or stroke risk. And what they were finding was that the glu it's a glucose dysregulation on its own that actually has a negative impact as well. And so the drops in blood glucose can actually have a negative impact. And the way that they think that that happens is due to the mitochondria being overwhelmed, producing free radicals. And free radicals are a sign of oxidative stress. 
And oxidative stress is just a fancy word of kind of chemical stress within the body. Um, and that leads to cell damage, DNA mutation and inflammation. And so they think that that's where this new research is coming in to saying really tight glucose control is actually really critical for preventing cardiovascular risk um, and stroke risk associated with type 2 diabetes. We'll keep going. So hemoglobin A1C, so I remember when this test came in, this is how old I am, um, and it really was, it really felt like a revolution because, you know, what you can take from a random blood glucose or a fasting blood glucose was often missed. And we were missing huge numbers of people walking around with type 2 diabetes. I mean, we still are missing a lot of people with type 2 diabetes, but hemoglobin A1C was a test that you could do and it took an average glucose of your average glucose levels over um, a two to three month period. But there are some issues with it. One is that you can get false elevations of hemoglobin A1C with people with iron deficiency and anemia, because as I mentioned before, it's the glycation of hemoglobin and hemoglobin is low when you've got anemia. So you get a false elevation of a higher level of hemoglobin A1C. So that's something just, you know, if you're doing a population-based study, um, it's it's got some flaws in it. But also, I mean, with your patients, you need to know what their iron levels and what their anemia status is um, if you're going to effectively use the hemoglobin A1C. The well, other I'm issue... Curious. Sorry. Is it? Yeah. Let's jump in. Um, I'm curious because not everyone would get their iron levels tested with every blood test either. So if they're just relying on HbA1c um, as a marker, how yeah. much of that would actually then be? I guess to be used? fair, yeah, to, to be fair, most doctors when they're doing hemoglobin A1c are likely to do a full blood examination. Okay. Um, and that will show them the level of hemoglobin at least. Mm -hmm. So obviously if it's deficient and they're doing the hemoglobin A1C, they can match that up. Iron levels are an, a different thing. I guess it's probably the most common form of anemia that we've got in our community. So um, uh, they, they still believe that like mild anemia probably doesn't impact hemoglobin A1C as much, but definitely moderate or severe anemia will, will definitely see an impact. How clinically relevant it is will depend upon the individual patient. Gotcha. But I think it's just good to know, um, you know, when we're testing that. The other interesting thing about hemoglobin A1C is that there's thought to be now a bit of an ideal hemoglobin A1C. So if you have a look down at the chart below, like obviously if your hemoglobin A1C average um, glucose readings are over 6.4 on an average level, that's considered to be diabetes. Pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4. So you can see that there's just a kind of gauge of normality. But what they think is the ideal is around 5.1 to 5.3. So it's very common that patients will go and see a doctor and they might have a hemoglobin A1C of 5.6 or even 5.65, and they're told everything is perfectly normal. So these are the little nuances that can be picked up early, particularly when you see that metabolic health and metabolism is such a primary kind of, it's almost like a keystone system within the body that has an impact of every single cellular function throughout the body. So kind of depending upon your style of patients that you've got, you know, there may be some patients that you might choose to talk about the ideal hemoglobin A1C as a point of motivation um, with that as well. The other I guess, um, drawback of the hemoglobin A1C is because it's an average over a certain period of time. If your patient does have quite a lot of dysregulation of glucose, i.e. they're getting highs, but they're also getting lows, you're actually going to average out that in a hemoglobin A1C and get a normal result as opposed to low glucose variability, which you can see on the right, is a nice steady line you might get equal levels of hemoglobin A1C with these particular, you know, examples, but in fact, you're missing the opportunity to see that this person might have quite a lot of lows. Does that make sense? 
what I really like about these two, like obviously the HbA1c is different for these two, but if we look around that fasting time where most people might get a blood test, their mm-hmm. levels are actually mostly the same. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that actual piece of information doesn't tell us a lot because around here we're sitting within the, the normal range of a fasting level, um, but then the rest of the variability actually happens the rest of the day as well. So that can be really interesting to kind of be able to see that information. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think when we just had fasting blood glucose or even random blood glucose, I mean, the chances of missing, um, you know, glucose dysregulation or impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes was extraordinarily high, you know, really kind of stabbing in the dark. Um, That were the dark old days days of medicine <laughs> well even with Fifely, michelle we're finding is it 67 percent of users are falling within mm-hmm. the pre-diabetic or diabetic ranges um right. so these are people who are describing like normal health as well so i think that's oh. really and it leads to an awesome opportunity for people that are particularly motivated and i mean part of Ivly is also to help educate people you know over a long period of time about the variable impacts of, you know, a good diet. I mean, you know, there's a lot that's impacting our metabolism um, and there's a lot we can do to help prevent um, any detrimental impacts from that as well. Absolutely, yes. So do you want to explain, because we've just recently changed how we actually measure um, glucose spikes, I guess, within the Vively app. Do you want to explain some of the markers that we're looking at? Yeah, sure. So as Charlotte mentioned, like often when we're fasting, our glucose levels are nice and low. And so if we take a a blood glucose level when we're fasting, we're usually within the normal range, unless you've got severe dysregulation of your glucose. Um, And there's a couple of other key points as well with that. However, it generally is, the beauty of a CGM is the ability to look at the glucose curve after you eat. So prandial is just a fancy scientific word for eat. (laughs) So post-eating glucose curves. And there's a couple of ways of looking at them. So one way of looking at it is area under the curve. So how high that spike goes and for how long, if you have um, a high spike that comes down quickly, you're going to have a certain area under the curve. Now, that could be the same as someone that has a lower spike that stays up for a, a longer period of time. So that's one way of looking at area under the curve. Um, and it s- seems to be... Uh, um attached to how well your body responds to that particular food and how i guess active your insulin levels and how your cells respond to insulin so that's a little bit about area under the curve glucose peak is also thought to be important so how high you go so some people will shoot up their glucose levels quite quickly and quite high but they'll come down quite quickly which is thought to be a reasonably healthy response And obviously the choices of what they're eating may may need to be shifted, but the fact that they come back down probably indicates a good level of cellular health, muscle health, et cetera. So they've got reserve there to manage those high levels. The, The third one is time to return to baseline. So sometimes what happens is the sugar levels go high and it will come down quite slowly, which means that it's going to take a long time for that body to come back into balance. And that's thought to be a little bit of a problem. It's also got to do with the macronutrient breakdown of the meal. So it can have things to do with how quickly you eat, um, the timing of the meal, um, the quality of your stomach, so how well you digest it, the time of the day impacts how we slept the night before, the levels of stress that you're experiencing and other lifestyle factors such as exercise um, and, and time and quality of exercise as well. So there's a lot about the time to return to baseline. And time in range is an overall effect. So rather than just looking at a postprandial meal, we look at the overall time that you stay in an optimal range. And that's a good way of looking at like a more average look at your postprandial glucose curves. Um, And so obviously if you have one meal a day where you might spike and the other times you might stay even, that's obviously going to be better than if you're spiking at every meal or staying out for long periods throughout the day as well. 
<clears throat> so having a look at the quality of the curve is, is an important way of looking at how you respond to the particular foods that you eat. How, when, yeah, and why. Great opportunities when you're actually looking at someone's data, for example, to ask the, those questions. Mm. So it might seem like, oh, I eat the same thing every day and I'm getting very variable responses. It's asking those other questions. Are you hydrated? How did you sleep last night? What are your stress levels like? Um, because that can provide a lot of information. Mm. Um, the other interesting thing that we see all the time and the research is starting to support it as well is if someone starts their day with a bigger spike, they're more likely to have more spikes throughout the rest of the day. So their glucose tolerance actually drops down um, mm -hmm. if they start their day with a big spike. Um, so a lot of people at the moment are sort of looking at um like promoting savory breakfast, for example, or your first meal of the day being savory, because we know protein has a lower impact on that glucose curve compared to just, say, carbohydrates. Um, interestingly as well, um, uh, carbohydrates and fats tend to bring the glucose levels up, but it takes longer to return to baseline versus if there's protein in there as well. So it can be really interesting to look at the individual curves and actually find that right fit. Um, and we'll go into this a little bit later as well, but finding that right fit for that person mm. as well. Um, and one other thing that we haven't mentioned which I probably should have put in here, and I'm seeing it a lot more than what we've ever sort of noticed in the research, is how many people have reactive hypoglycemia. So they're having this big spike and then having a crash afterwards as well and noticing those feelings of um, like symptomatic hypoglycemia as well. Um, and so that if the first spike or the first glucose rise of the day is causing a drop that's really driving increased appetite increased um, carbohydrate intake and quick fix foods as well um, so this information can yeah really prompt us to ask some more questions like how does that feel when your glucose levels are high mm -hmm. or um, noticing your levels stayed really high after this particular meal did you notice, like, were you tired? Um, were you moving? Were you sitting in a meeting for that for that hour after a meal? Um, so that it's just another thing just to keep in mind as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, they're all amazing tips as well. And so, also what, what I was going to say is also dips are associated with anxiety too. So yes. functional hyperglycemia, people can actually trip into anxiety and then they believe that, their anxiety is actually sort of you know coming from them whereas it, it can actually be a biochemical trigger point um to a particular change in mood or thinking patterns as well so um it can be a catalyst for change so managing and smoothing out those um glucose dips and troughs can actually have a huge impact on a person's motivation and anxiety levels as well Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> and I think part of that turns it away from someone um, blaming themselves or feeling mm. like that questioning and that judgment to like the curiosity of, oh, that's really interesting. I'm noticing this pattern that three o'clock every afternoon after my chocolate, I have a crash and my anxiety is through the roof um, or whatever it might look like for that person. Um, so I've just included in here as well a little bit of a snapshot of what you, we sort of look at um, with our practitioner dashboard for Vively. So what this does is pulls together the two weeks worth of data or as it's um, additive. So the average glucose at the top there, the glucose variability, so how many big spikes or how much change is happening. Um, we also provide people with their time in range. So how much time are they actually spending in that optimal four to six millimole range, um, as well as the estimated HbA1c. So this data, and Michelle, you can talk more about this, we can't use this as diagnostic um, because it still requires the blood test results. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, as, as it mentions, an estimated hemoglobin A1c. So it's always good to correlate that to a, a blood test hemoglobin A1c. They're reasonably synergistic, but again, you know, um, in the context of anemia, um, et cetera, and other things, certainly the blood test is much more accurate. Um, and also the CGM is not diagnostic in any uh, area of medicine, whether you're using it for 
um, in the diabetic or a disease orientated state, or whether you're using it pre for prevention, it should never be used as a diagnostic tool and should always be correlated with blood tests through your health practitioner. So it's just a fantastic guide. The other thing to note too is that it's more accurate, a CGM is more, more accurate when the blood sugar levels are high as compared to low. And so even if you're using a CGM uh, and you do have a type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes, you should never respond to a low blood glucose levels in a CGM without correlating it to a finger prick blood test. A finger prick blood test is much more accurate for low blood glucose levels. Mm. So we might quickly go through the role of CGM in preventative health because um, we've got to touch on all of our other factors as well. Yes. So Michelle, do you want to go through some of this stuff? Yeah, so what, we, what I mean, you know, obviously Charlotte and I have been looking at the role of CGM for prevention health for, for many years now, and it is really just a new and burgeoning area for health. And people started to get really interested when they were looking at type 2, people with type 2 diabetes and those that were using CGM before it was really um, more prevalent, found that those that used a CGM had better ability to maintain good behavioural interventions such as keeping up with diet or weight loss interventions that were that were planned for them or exercise interventions, et cetera. And so they started getting curious about the role of CGM and looking at this dynamic relationship to the blood glucose levels to really teach people about their own health in a real-time situation. So there's been some um, research came out of China um, and, uh, and also in America, I think. Um, and so this is one thing that came in 2020, Erdhart and Zagal, which 90% felt CGM data supported better lifestyle choices. 47% felt it made them feel more likely to exercise if they had high glucose levels. And 87% felt it assisted with healthier food choices. Now, I know, I mean, most of you are sort of working with patients and motivation can be really challenging. And so using something like a CGM, if it's going to help 90% feel that they do better lifestyle choices, that is huge data. So it's really quite a powerful way of actually having a representation uh, and a way in which to develop communication between patients and, um, and yourselves. So, yeah, there was, there was another study in 2018 which found a significant number of non-diabetic individuals had abnormal glucose regulation. So we found about 67% of our patients who considered themselves metabolically healthy to have found that they've, in fact, got impaired glucose tolerance levels. And that has been motivation enough to improve key lifestyle factors and we've actually seen quite a number of people actually reverse what would be considered pre-diabetic not that we have diagnosed them because vitally is not a diagnostic tool but in in fact it's just generated a curiosity in people that have led to um, them seeking different um, interventions with their health so we are potentially missing a lot of people we know in singapore the singapore government's actually paying for every person to have two cgms a year as a way of picking up pre-diabetes and diabetes earlier. They're very progressive government. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, patients that are really keen on using CGM are actually just, um, you know, are, are really motivated to be able to pick up these signs earlier and do something more about it earlier and easier in real time. I think another one thing, to keep in mind as well is that the research is still emerging as to what is normal. We have so much evidence around what is considered abnormal in diabetic responses and that sort of thing. So we're still getting this research to what is the optimal response. Um, we know the least amount of risk. Um, so that's really interesting. That sort of data is starting to come out now as well, which is exciting. Um, so you mentioned about high insulin responses earlier. Um, mm. Do you want to go through why that's an issue? So one of the reasons why, I mean, it, it's interesting in um, in the world of medicine. We, I, my personally, I don't think we test insulin levels enough. But what we do know in type two diabetes is that the insulin levels do rise about ten to fifteen years prior to glucose dysregulation being a feature of the condition. 
And we know that high levels of insulin are problematic of their own right. They're associated with visceral fat, they're associated with adiposity, they're associated with inflammation, and they're associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. So they are also strongly associated with retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. And so they're all the kind of what we call the microvascular um, features of type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is something really key to look at. So metabolic health is associated with hyperinsulinemia, and it is a really big problem even if your glucose levels remain within the normal level and even though your hemoglobin a1c may be within the normal level or the pre-diabetic ranges insulin is a is a big issue and really worth having a look into definitely so we might quickly run through all of those other markers so um, lipid profiles you mentioned that they are really vital for hormones and that kind of thing do you want to go through the well, yeah, so obviously your lipid profile, I mean, the, the ordinary lipid profile that you get through, you know, um, mainstream medicine is, is probably less than optimal. Um, however, it is still an arguably a very good, you know, test in the sense that if it comes back completely normal, that is a great thing. Too high a cholesterol is a problem, too low a cholesterol is a problem, but some people will argue that as well. Probably the major issue to look for is the ratios between the good and the bad um, cholesterol and having a look at triglycerides. Triglycerides independent of LDL and HDL are of their own a significant risk factor for metabolic dysfunction as well. So it's worth doing a cholesterol profile in people. Um, they need to be obviously fasted and they need to look at the ratios between the good and the bad. That would be one thing um, that I would take home. So I think as well, like talking about all the interconnectedness, there is that link between glucose dysregulation and developing dyslipidemia. And it's trying to identify like chicken and egg sort of scenario as well, which part of metabolic dysfunction is showing mm. up first and it's probably beyond the scope of this um, conversation but a lot of misinformation about cholesterol as well so we make most of our cholesterol within our liver um, and so what we get from food is usually just a supplement when we make excessive or we get cholesterol or lipid dysregulation, it often comes from excessive carbohydrate load and micronutrient dysfunction as well. So it's really about excessive macronutrients as in eating too much and not eating high quality foods and reversing those trends can make a big difference in your lipid profiles. Definitely. And what about hypertension? How does that play a role? So hypertension is interesting. I mean, I think the thing that most people kind of forget is it's called hypertension, as in it's high tension equals high stress on the body. So the muscles, so there's muscles that line the endothelial cells. So there's muscles that line your blood vessels. So not the muscles in terms of biceps and your quadriceps, but they're called smooth muscles and they can become tense as well. Um, and so obviously high blood pressure is a key, 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 um, marker for cardiovascular disease. It's a key marker for stroke. Um, it's also a key marker for, for glucose or, sorry, cortisol dysregulation as well. It increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke. And the kidneys are very, very sensitive and the retina as well to high blood pressure. So they're things that we really, yeah, um, uh, don't like to see. Um, obviously, lifestyle factors are big. Stress is a big one. Micronutrient dis, um, deficiencies are another one. Um, eating sleep uh, is poor. And also visceral fat and metabolic syndrome will actually increase um, hypertension. Uh, so, yeah, it's a decrease. It's like a stiffening of the arteries are, are a major risk factor. And that can or maybe due to atherosclerosis or plaque buildup within them, but it doesn't necessarily have to be either. It can just be high tension throughout the whole system. Uh, and it really is part of what we look for in metabolic dysfunction. So waist circumference, this is one of the best, best things to do for your patients. So the waist is just around the belly button. It's very easy to... Um, 
to take. And it's one of the most profound influencing markers for visceral fat and for metabolic syndrome. So if you do anything, I would be doing waist circumferences on everyone. It's a great way, particularly if people are losing weight, to see whether they're losing fat versus losing muscle. It's just so easy, so simple, so cheap, um, and really a fantastic thing to do. You can do a waist versus hip ratio, which will give you some extra um extra information but waist circumference on its own is perfectly fine there's also DEXA scans and very fancy bio um, impedance scans and stuff that you can do which people love to do there's also a fantastic app um, that your patients might be interested it costs about ten dollars a month and it's called body map m-a-p-p uh, it's very so that uses the same technology as face recognition and it gives a kind of map of the body what it looks like and it gives an estimate of visceral fat and hip versus waist ratio and all those things it's quite it's quite amazing um, and very easy to do in your own home so that takes the if, if any of your patients are in the country and can't access a DEXA scan it's it's not a bad um a bad approach so visceral fat as we know is terrible um it builds up inside the organs around the organs and it's it's one of the most significant influencing risk factors for long-term chronic disease from diabetes to sleep apnea to metabolic dysfunction type 2 diabetes dementia etc cancer so um it's a big one so now we're going to jump into, I'm just cautious of time as well, but um, optimizing and personalizing metabolic health. So we have what is metabolic health? What are those factors? Um, we'll focus mostly on glucose metabolism at the moment because that's what we have most of our data on. So I'm going to quickly jump into um, nutrition as the first one, but the other four pillars that we focus on at Vively are nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress. Um, so when it comes to personalizing nutrition, um, there's quite a few things that I like to make sure that it's highly individual individualized for the person. So just even from seeing a couple of those graphs that we've shown today, you can see how everybody is completely different. Their responses are completely different. So I often look at timing of meals. Um, so looking at their glucose metabolism over the day, what we're starting to learn is that um, our glucose metabolism is influenced by circadian rhythm. So a small but really um, nice study found that um, the same meal eaten at a different time of day, so I think they did like 8 a.m., 12 noon, 8 p.m., and maybe midnight, um, the nighttime and evening um, midnight one had a dramatically different response compared to the one that was eaten earlier in the morning with the same meal. Um, so looking at that for people, it might be I noticed that lots of people have their biggest spike in the evening trying to swap lunch and dinner and seeing if that influences it what that can do then is allow the body time to actually bring down those fasting glucose levels so we're not starting our day high um, we also look at their fasting window so there's evidence that shows that just a 12-hour fasting window can have dramatic benefits for people including their gut health their glucose metabolism um, and again, we're just starting to learn more of that. It doesn't have to be extreme fasting, but 12 hours from the last meal of the day. And again, avoiding that sort of nighttime snacking or those higher carbohydrate foods over the night can be really beneficial. Um, looking at the macronutrient breakdown, which I did mention earlier. Um, so what sort of proportion of the meal is providing fiber or protein, fats and carbohydrates, making sure that there's adequate vegetables on the plate because um, that can be such a valuable source of micronutrients and fiber that actually can influence how our body digests the rest of the meal. Um, also looking, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but looking at that hunger and fullness awareness. So how hungry am I getting? If I'm getting these big spikes in the morning, what does the rest of the day look like? If I can change those responses, can I get a little bit more fullness out of my meals or a little bit more satiety in between those eating opportunities so I don't need to snack nearly as often? Um, this is something that personally I learned. I have always identified as a snacker. I eat small and often. Um, and in changing some of my habits I've, and changing that, um, 
macro like makeup of the foods I can go a lot longer without meals and my family doesn't know what's going on um, so but again highly highly individual for that person um, so what we like to encourage as well when someone is using a CGM is encouraging self-experimentation so what are those things that you want to know like it doesn't have to be perfect but can we get curious and can we learn from this experience um i often say if you've got a party wear the cgm so that way you can actually make really informed choices next time rather than optimizing what might already be a pretty good base so really <laughs> being able to find out as much as you can about how your body responds to different different factors. Um, there's also the micronutrients and some herbs that play a big role. And Michelle, did you want to touch on that? Yeah, so we're, we're running out of time. We're really mindful, but we've, we're having some more of these um, webinars. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to tune in. But micronutrients play a hugely important role in glucose metabolism in terms of the pancreas role and insulin signaling um, cell membrane health is really important as well. So the quality of your fat, so omega-3 fatty acids deficiencies can impact um, the way that the insulin signals to the energy production and me metabolic health. Zinc is a massive one. It's very highly deficient in our community, up to about 75% of women of child rearing age are low in zinc. Um, and certain groups like pregnancy, breastfeeding, adolescence are often low in zinc too. So that can be key kind of times that metabolic dysfunction can begin. Um, so zinc is an important one. Magnesium is super important for the insulin signaling as well. Um, and it can also help with sleep and muscle health too. And these are just a couple of other ones. Vitamin D, as many, many people know, super important for cell signaling, immune function, um, brain function, nervous system regulation, but it also plays a role in insulin and glucose metabolism. Chromium's are another one which helps with kind of the sweetness of food. We're often low in chromium. The way that I can kind of tell is it's very difficult to try and have a glass of white wine and some chocolate. When you have enough chromium, your sugar cravings decrease. White wine is full of chromium. And I try, try some chocolate tonight. If you're a white wine drinker, have some white wine, try some chocolate. You will understand that chocolate does not go with white wine, does not go with chromium. So it's a good one to know. Um, big root vitamins are really important. And there's some key other nutrients that we actually make in our body we can use medicinally, like inositol and alpha-lipoic acid. Um, alpha-lipoic acid's got some very good research in terms of supporting the nervous system um, and that microvascular um, elements of disease preve prevention um, too. And just below, berberine is a, um, a key nutrient that comes from certain herbs such as golden seal it's got some really good research on glucose regulation um, that is burgeoning that some say is as good as metformin which is the key um, type 2 diabetic drug jemina bitter melon and cinnamon they one is a western herb one is a chinese herb and one is an ayurvedic herb um, throughout the world they've been using these herbs to help support glucose um, regulation for thousands of years so the sages and the wise old doctors knew that sugar regulation was really important way back when they started using these things historically and traditionally thousands of years ago so there's some. And I definitely think that's a whole um, a whole webinar in itself. I've got a lot of questions for you on that one. Um, so looking at exercise, so this is something. There's different forms of exercise. Again, I think it's really important um, recognizing where your patient is at in terms of what's going to be beneficial. The number of people that I've seen that have seen their glucose responses and decided to add in high intensity exercise only to find that that actually increases their glucose responses and keeps them higher. Um, so generally speaking, low to moderate intensity exercise decreases our glucose levels as the muscles really take on that fuel source and use it as available. Um, the liver releases some stored glucose to maintain the sugar levels, um, but it also can increase the insulin sensitivity, helping the muscles actually function really well. Um, as I mentioned, that high intensity exercise can cause a temporary spike 
um, just because the body needs more energy quickly. So it uses energy rapidly um, and it can be quite confronting when you see that bigger spike on, on the graph as well. But afterwards, it's really interesting. They have We have what we call this halo effect. So the halo effect is where in up to 24 hours for some people, their glucose responses and their insulin sensitivity is improved just from that exercise so it might not be a daily thing that someone can do but they could get the benefits a couple of times a week of really um, of that higher intensity exercise as well um, michelle did you have anything to add about exercise so, so yeah just on that point of high intensity exercise particularly if someone has quite a lot of stress going on in their lives <clears throat> the reason why high intensity exercise is really good for us is that it is a stress on the body and the body then improves itself in a process called hormesis. So it makes itself stronger because of that intermittent stress or when that's great. And that is exactly how exercise or one of the reasons why exercise is so good for us and highly recommended. But in the times where people are really under other forms of chronic stress, whether they're aware of it or not aware of it, that's when we can see if that sugar levels is staying high for a long period of time and not coming down, then that person may not be ready for that high intensity exercise just yet. And what we think is happening is that if we can get them into good, low to moderate intensity exercise, work on the macro and the micronutrients, get the glucose a little bit steadier and then try again in a couple of months to make sure that the extra stressor that high intensity exercise does, does actually what it's um, meant to, which is help the body build resilience rather than the other way around. Now sleep, this is such an underrated one for us as well. And this is something that um, is quite interesting how it can lead to insulin resistance um, and our cells ability to use glucose. Michelle, do you want to talk through why that is? Uh, so yeah, well, the quality of sleep, a lot happens when we sleep. So basically it's a very metabolically active time when we sleep and the immune system, inflammation system, the cellular repair systems, how the hormones will all interrelate all happens under the guise of sleep. When we don't sleep well, that definitely impacts our ability of these key adaptogenic hormones to impact how stable our body is. So um, when we don't sleep well, we're much more likely to have glucose dysregulation the following day, and it can, can impact up to 48 to 72 hours after a poor night's sleep. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> and then the lucky last one um, is stress. So I know this one is a big one for you, Michelle. So talk to us about stress. Yeah, exactly. So um, we could probably do a whole webinar on stress. But I mean, our body was um, has evolved to be able to tolerate acute stressors very well. It's actually designed in a way of impacting this very immediate stress response. For example, if we're under imminent danger in the wild, a wild animal or a, a natural disaster, et cetera, our body is geared to activate this acute stress response. And then we're meant to rest and go back into a growth and repair phase of the body. What's happened in modern culture is that we've developed these conditions of chronic stress. So where the threat is something that is out of our control and therefore um, the, the threat becomes omnipotent and ubiquitous and kind of ever present. And we don't tend to then go back into the growth and the rest and the digest kind of phase as much as we actually ideally need to. And so what Vivaly is all about is teaching people about the role of stress in glucose metabolism because, and metabolic health because it is such a ubiquitous form of metabolic stress and strain in most people's lives. It can impact sleep, it can impact exercise, it can impact food choices, and it impacts the chemicals and the hormonal cellular messages that are associated with glucose dysregulation. So it's very much a, a dualistic um, approach. And also there's a lot of hidden stress. So neuroplasticity and the science of neuroplasticity has shown that we adapt to high stress environments. That's part of our superpower of being a homeo sapien. 
So we have this ability to normalize stress. We have this ability to adapt to chronic stress. And so there's other really hidden stealth-like stresses that we have kind of normalized in our society. Alcohol is one of them. Uh, hidden sugars in our food is another one. Toxins is another one, you know, from uh, pesticides to air pollution to noise pollution even. Overexercise, as we mentioned in the previous slide, and other physiological stresses such as perimenopause, pregnancy, chronic pain, breastfeeding, pregnancy, um, adolescence. They're all times of biological stress where our requirements from the environment change significantly. And most of us actually minimise or diminish that level of stress in our society and kind of just soldier on. And so as a role as a health practitioner, it's really important to really highlight some of those potential hidden stresses for patients. And Vivoli can help you do that by looking at other key factors alongside just diet and exercise um, in, your, in your treatment programs. So for those of you that aren't aware, we've got our Vively Health dashboard, which we were really excited to release at the end of last year. So this is a free dashboard for practitioners to be able to look at the kind of data and support your patients um, as well. We've got a help centre there that goes through a lot of the information that we've discussed this evening as well. Um, and you can monitor the metabolic health metrics as well as like exercise stress and those sleep markers as well. Um, so we might open it up quickly to some Q&A if you've got some burning questions. Um, before we, um, before I forget as well, we do have a Facebook group, um, the Vively Health Partners Community. So please join us there. So if we don't get to your questions this evening, we can absolutely continue the conversation afterwards as well. Um, so if you want to put those questions in the chat, um, we've got that. There is a raise hand function in this one potentially maybe not maybe not <laughs> that's <laughs> all right um so if anyone has any questions if not um we will be following everyone um up with an email afterwards so if we've gone through things too quickly um or if you want us to cover different topics next time or specific areas please let us know as well um because we're just starting to plan for the year um so michelle right. i'm gonna I'll yep. ask you this question. So I have a chronic fatigue client with no abnormalities in her blood. Would you think Fively would be good? So that's a great question, by the way. Um, it's quite common to, to see bloods to be completely normal. There's a lot that goes um, on behind the scenes. And so Vively can sometimes be a really great interface for people to understand this intersection between nutrition, exercise, sleep and stress. And so they're very ubiquitous, very common issues that, as I mentioned before, can actually be sort of very minimised um, in everyday life these days. Because everyone's got stress and nobody really sleeps very much anymore and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the influences are quite strong. So it's definitely worth looking at. When I choose Vivaly for my patients, you know, it, it can sometimes be an opportunity for change. It can be for those people that have got a really good knowledge that really want to refine it. It can also be wonderful for those that really don't have very much knowledge and how the environment influences themselves too. So wherever your patient is at, I think it's a great intervention to teach them about the intersection of these key lifestyle factors in their health. Absolutely. I definitely agree. Um, even for some patients that I've worked with who have got, again, normal normal bloods, sometimes for them it's just empowering to actually be mm -hmm. able to see inside and take action for the things. Um, so a particular patient that comes to mind was... Um, weekends was wine and um, actually seeing the impact of just one night or two nights a week on her sleep and also her glucose responses the day after up to two days after after mm -hmm. having alcohol was really powerful to actually then make informed decision about that particular behavior as well um we've got another question what are normal waist measurements for men and women um and for polynesians which would have a larger waist and bmi Oh, off the top of my head, I think it's less than 88 centimetres for women and 
less than 90 something for men. Um, it's very easy to look up those measurements. I mean, you're absolutely right. Different nationalities like Polynesians, Samoans, um, et cetera, will have different waist hip ratios. And so it's just worth looking up that data that will be there too. Um, Polynesians tend to have huge problems with BMI. BMI is not great for that particular ethnic group. Um, and this is where things like a DEXA scan can sometimes be of great value um, for that particular group of people too. So have a look online for what is a normal um, waist measurement. The other thing about waist measurement too is that even if your patient is abnormal, it's also a great measure to see change. Um, so even if they have got elevated waist measurements, if they're reducing that by even two centimetres, it really does have, a, it's a good correlation with fat loss as opposed to muscle loss or fluid loss. Um, and so it can be a nice motivational tool if they come back regularly and you do their waist measurement as well in the context of, of all of the other lifestyle factors that they're trying to adapt to. Um, and the one last question that we'll get to this evening, I'm seeing big spikes with eating fruit going up as much as poor carbs like a muffin. Would I need to take that into account or not? Um, I would definitely say yes, um, taking that into account because as we explored, there is still that um, potential for oxidative stress resulting from the glucose spike regardless of the fruit or the food that's eaten. I'm not saying don't eat fruit. There's absolutely benefits to eating fruit from a micro um, nutrient perspective, the polyphenols. There's so much that we can get from it. But I think sometimes it's exploring how we eat that food. So fruit on its own is likely to cause a big glucose spike because the carb or the, the sugar to fiber ratio probably isn't enough to offset that spike. Having said that, having fruit as a dessert after a higher protein meal with lots of veggies, that won't have as much of an impact. Or um, if you're pairing that fruit as a snack, for example, adding nuts and seeds beforehand, some Greek yogurt, um, a boiled egg or that kind of thing can really help with that response also. So again, it's a, this opportunity for experimentation because for everyone it's completely different. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention as well, a short walk or some bodyweight exercises after a meal um, is really beneficial for dampening those glucose responses. Um, and looking, lastly, looking at actually the volume or the portion of that um, thing as well. So with the foods, for some people, it might be, I can't stop eating grapes. It's like, well, what if we swapped your grapes for an apple, which is going to have less of an impact, but it's more of a um, controlled volume as well, or comparing water melon to um, a bowl of berries is really interesting just to see which fruits can cause those different responses as well but I definitely don't put blanket rules on foods because my go-to response when it comes to any food is it depends on the context and the person as well so I think that's often um, where we can get a lot of joy out of exploring and experimenting and finding the right answers for you. So um, we've got one last observation. So I did an exploration this morning, did a hit class, came home, had flat white coffee and felt great. Then a bit later, two dates with 85% dark chocolate and black coffee with MCT oil. Felt weird, finger pricked, and my glucose had gone up to nine. Went and made a savoury salad dish and it dropped to five really interesting to be able to see those responses so I would actually suggest just to get curious and say could you swap that so start with a salad followed with some um, dark chocolate afterwards and see what the response looks like is it different mm. um, so it's all about this ability to optimize your yeah. responses and you might also find with that like looking at a hit class and then followed by two coffees just might be a a little bit extra on your cortisol levels or your stress response levels as well. So that might be something to, to have a think about as well. Mm. Definitely. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michelle, as always. Um, we will be doing these fireside chats monthly. So um, when the email comes through with that recording, if there's anything that you'd like us to cover, please let us know. Um, and, yeah, if more questions come up, um, join us on our Facebook community. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. See ya.